thanks everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to be talking about building apps in Kubernetes, uh, and we've got a few demos to run through. So I'm going to not try not spend too much time on slides, but I think it's important to acknowledge the importance of keeping credentials safe. The uh, the recent Twitter breach uh, is just a great example where uh, some folks got access to some uh, to a Slack to an internal Slack channel where. Uh, tool credentials were posted, uh, actually pinned in a Slack channel, and that gave them the credentials they needed to do the, uh, the, the bit of mischief that, that they did last week. Uh, we've seen similar with Tesla, um, where it was actually a Kubernetes console that had been configured to not require uh, any credentials to access, uh, and someone had uh, put any of us access keys in Kubernetes and they were able to, the, the, the hacker was able to access those through the browser, through the uh, Kubernetes console and see those secrets and, and then copy those secrets and use those. So the, the point is, how do we keep credentials safe? We can't actually build applications without secrets, but how do we keep those secrets out of the hands of people who would, uh, who would do mischief by them? Um, we often see a lot of tension or, or at least some tension between the application development teams, the DevOps groups, the cloud teams that are trying to move quickly to deliver business value, uh, and the security teams who are trying to keep some controls in place, uh, and and you know this friction sometimes bears out in um, either development going off and doing their own thing, that you know, kind of a rehash of the shadow IT that that we've seen recur in in different forms over the years. Or the security team owns everything and becomes a bottleneck. And, and in neither cases is that a win-win scenario. What we really want to do is enable that DevOps collaboration between the security teams and the development teams. Enable developers to be secure as transparently as possible. Relieve them of the reporting burdens uh, that security is, is used to dealing with in terms of audit, risk, compliance, uh, these types of things. Um, and empower the security team to deliver a service or, or deliver a capability that developers won't find cumbersome uh, and, and, and more importantly, won't find a bottleneck uh, or an impairment to their workflows. So this, you know, the whole uh, good old shift left mentality is, is alive and well here. And this is what we're enabling uh, folks to do. We want to make development secure, uh, but we want to do it with the oversight of the security team. Um, and so it is a shared responsibility. And we um, have, you know, sort of itemized these best practices. Uh, the first step is absolutely getting hard-coded secrets out of your applications. Most people have gotten that memo and, and have, have at least uh, taken steps to do that. But of course, as soon as you start removing secrets, you need a place to put those. And so there is a tendency to put secrets into the most at-hand place. You know, if you're in AWS, you might look at AWS Secrets Manager. If you're in Azure, you might look at Azure Key Vault. If you're in Kubernetes, obviously you're gonna look at Kubernetes Secrets. So we call these security islands. They're little pockets of security and they may be okay in and of themselves, but this, this audit risk compliance uh, practice really requires some insight. The security team needs to understand how credentials are being used, how they're being secured. And it's very difficult when you have multiple multiples of those islands. Um, no, in, in, in this time of COVID uh, and the time of, of very porous network boundaries, um, it, it's not been any more obvious that perimeters don't work anymore. So identities really are the only way of securing privilege. So we need to create identities for absolutely everything, especially anything that's going to be accessing a, a sensitive system. We need to authenticate it strongly, uh, limit its scope so it, it, it's authorized to access only what it needs to, the principle of least privilege. Uh, and we want to eliminate this problem uh, that I'll speak more to around secret zero. How do we secure that bootstrap uh, credential that applications need to kick, kick this, this all off? Uh, credential rotation is a fundamental best practice for just ensuring that if a secret gets compromised, and you have to assume that they will be, you have to assume that credentials will at some point get compromised. Rotation effectively nukes that, that secret in such a way that whoever has it is no longer of any use. So, so aggressive, uh, regular rotation uh, of secrets, especially secrets being used by applications is, is critical. But that also then says, how do we do that in such a way that applications aren't disrupted, that applications connectivity 
uh, and ability to connect back in systems isn't, isn't uh, impaired because the last thing we want is for application downtime to be triggered by uh, credential, you know, good credential management. So uh, applications always have to be able to get their secrets. They always have to be able to connect back in systems, but we want to do all that securely. Uh, spoken to this issue of security islands, but this is the current state we see most organizations in uh, where they have uh, homegrown solutions or they're using capabilities of the tools of the platforms that they're running in to store secrets. Uh, we'll talk a fair bit here today about Kubernetes secrets, um, some of the challenges with that, some of the things that we can do that we can help with in terms of uh, mitigating the risk of those. Uh, but this, this is the current state that, that, that we're seeing most organizations in. Uh, and and we're, we're coming to market as a security company and putting security first, but providing that. So I like to say we're a security company that gets DevOps. And so we're empowering the security team to do that governance risk compliant, uh, governance risk compliance reporting, uh, but not getting in the way of, of uh, the, the development workflows. So we want everything to have an identity, whether it's a person or a process. Uh, we want strong authentication for all of that. We want to authorize with least privilege. So we're only granting access to what the identity needs and no more than that. Uh, and then we obviously want to audit everything. All activity needs to be audited so that if there is uh, an issue, we, we are able to detect it as quickly as possible and certainly do that sort of post-mortem analysis to, to understand what, what happened or, or you know, what identity went rogue. The secret zero problem is unique to applications. So humans have a built-in vault uh, where they can mostly remember their own passwords uh, or at least answers to security questions. But the non-humans, uh, where does that bootstrap password go or that token or the, or the cert or whatever that credential is, where do you store that in such a way that the application can get it, but nobody else can? How do you secure it, uh, but still leave it accessible to the application? We call this the secret zero problem. Um, and, and we've devised ways around that. So uh, this is often one of the first questions I get when I'm talking about this space. Uh, people have wrestled with this uh, and it is, it is a, a difficult problem. There's basically two ways to do authentication. One is credential based and in the human world, this is your passport or your driver's license. It's a thing that you have that uh, vouches for your identity that says you are who you say you are. In the application world, we have API keys, we have tokens, we have certs, but these are all things that have to be stored somewhere. Uh, and they create that secret zero problem. These, these credentials can be stolen and used to impersonate an identity. And so a stronger way of doing authentication is to use attributes that can be validated with a trusted authority. Uh, and so if we think about um, biometrics in the human world, uh, if I have my fingerprints on record or if my retina scan is on record, then when I go to the airport and I go through the clear kiosk and I present my fingerprints, they can be compared to my fingerprints on record. And that's a much stronger way of authenticating myself. It's, it's, uh, it's much harder to steal fingerprints. Uh, and so uh, we wanna use this same type of, of approach with applications, but we need a way to verify these attributes, uh, these attributes. So the idea is that we are going to allow list. We are going to pre-enroll or predefine identities along with the attributes that will be used to validate them. And then at runtime, when that request comes in, we can say, is this an identity we know? If it's not even on the list of, of allowed identities, we can reject that, that request outright. If it is on the allowed list, then we can call back to the platform uh, to validate that identity. And this is the approach that we take in Kubernetes, as well as on the cloud platforms, and even with some tools, where we can look at each of these as a trusted authority to understand and know what's running in it. And we can use the attributes uh, of, of, of a Jenkins job, of a IAM role in AWS, of uh, metadata uh, job tokens in, in Azure, use those as platform attributes to validate the, these, uh, these actors, these, these pods or these applications. Um, so the flow, uh, and I'm going to be specifically talking about the open source uh, solution Conjure. So CyberArk Conjure is a, an open source vault uh, for storing and retrieving secrets. Uh, it is um, available uh, at conjure.org. Uh, there's lots of content here, lots of good blog content uh, talking about the secret zero problem uh, and various aspects of 
application or, or secrets management uh, for applications. Uh, the APIs are well documented here, um, and and we we've got just just a ton of content. We'll we'll be referring back to that. So uh, we're going to be talking about secrets management in the context of open source Conjure. Um, the workflow here is that you authenticate using some strategy. So we support multiple different strategies for different platforms and different use cases. However, authentication happens. Successful authentication results in us issuing a short-lived job token. This is a token that has an eight minute time to live. And basically it's a bearer token that can be used to retrieve secrets. The secrets are retrieved based on authorization per policies. So we authenticate to validate the, the identity of the application. That identity is constrained to access only the things that it's been allowed to access. And assuming it's, it, it makes a request for a secret that it has access to, it can retrieve that secret and use it. Um, and that secret could be a certificate, it can be an SSH key, it could be a password, uh, it could be a token, basically any binary value uh, that we want to use for, for credentials can be used to connect to these, these target systems, these backend systems. Um, at the end of eight minutes though, that token will expire and the application has to re-authenticate. And this will play into some of the use cases that we'll be demoing here shortly. Um, because that access token, when it expires, basically you've lost access to secrets. Um, and given that we want applications to always have access to their secrets, um, there's certain, certain things that have to be done to, uh, to, um, to address that. So to dig into Kubernetes authentication in the Conjure environment a little bit more, uh, this is elaborating on that workflow that I talked through a minute ago. Basically, the, the application identity is uh, allow listed or white listed, and it's defined, or its attributes are defined in terms of the cluster and the namespace that it's running in. So we effectively give an identity to the cluster, and of course, namespaces are, are, are native in, in Kubernetes. And so these would be ways of validating an identity. Now, this, this means that applications running in the same namespace would share the same identity. And sometimes you wanna go more granular than that. So we also give you the ability to uh, add a service account. A Kubernetes service account has an attribute that can be validated for that identity. So the identity is just a friendly name, uh, but these attributes are annotations on that identity that we can use to validate it at runtime. So that's the identity gets defined via policy. Uh, gets loaded into Conjure uh, and defines that identity along with the attributes. Um, at runtime, a, a, a helper container uh, running either as a sidecar or as an init container will do what, what is effectively a spiffy workflow. This is where the authenticator is going to format a certificate signing request. Um, the ultimate goal is to create a, a mutual TLS connection with the uh, server, with the Conjure, Conjure server. The authenticator submits that certificate signing request with the attributes from the pod, metadata attributes from the pod that can be used to validate that pod with Kubernetes. So when that request comes in, Conjure will parse that CSR, call back to the Kubernetes API to validate those attributes if those attributes are for an identity that's known and they check out with, with uh, Kubernetes, then we will issue that access token. Um, that access token then, uh, well, actually, we will issue a cert and a private key that can be used for credentials for authentication using that mutual TLS protocol. Um, and then uh, that authentication gives us the access token. If you're familiar with Spiffy, this is uh, basically that, that same workflow. Uh, and in fact, the certificate that is issued, the credentials uh, that are issued here contain a Spiffy SBIT. So we're very bullish on spiffy and the whole idea of, uh, of defining identities for workloads, not for infrastructure. We want to authenticate workloads, not the infrastructure that they're running on. Spiffy is uh, part of the CNCF uh, framework the, the, under the umbrella of CNCF, uh, and they're doing really great work around how do you establish uh, identities, strong identities and strong authentication for applications. So we're basically using that workflow uh, where the, the authenticator is the client uh, and the, the other party is the, the Conjure uh, server and, and using that Spiffy workflow to create uh, uh, a Spiffy SVID, a Spiffy verifiable identity document, which is that 509 cert. Uh, so, um, so that's, that's a, a bit about that. 
So um, we're on to the demos now, which I think is the more interesting part of, of any presentation. Um, uh, feel free to ask any questions. You know, if anything wasn't clear of anything I went over, uh, we're basically going to go through some some examples of how authentication works in various ways of retrieving secrets. We've got several different demos here. Uh, I call them labs. I've got, this is actually set up to be a multi-user lab. If, if uh, anyone ever wanted to uh, run a clinic or, or or attend one of our workshops. Um, and we're going to uh, walk through several different ways of retrieving secrets that are supported by Conjure. So sometimes people just want an API. And, and a lot of times developers are just saying, where is the documentation for your APIs? Well, it's, it's here. You know, the API docs are here. Uh, if you go to the developer uh, box here, here's our REST APIs. Uh, and here, here's all the stuff for how to, how to retrieve secrets, how to authenticate. Uh, so it's all right there. There's no gate on it. Um, and so you can, you can go look at this at your leisure. Uh, so what we're going to show is how to pull uh, deep database credentials via the REST API for the app to connect to a database. Now, I don't actually have a database to connect to except for this last example. So we're just going to show retrieval of the secrets and, and echoing of those secrets in these first three labs. Um, but, but to get on with that, um, this is my demo environment. We do a cube cuddle here. I'm just running uh, with Docker Desktop Kubernetes, which is, is hugely convenient. Uh, I used to use Minikube a lot, but now that uh, Kubernetes is in Docker Desktop, I, I seem to only use that anymore. Um, if I do a get pods here in my uh, test apps namespace, um, and what I'm going to do is just alias that so I don't have to keep typing that. So, so you guys don't have to watch me type that. Uh, equals bang bang. Now I can say KGP and that's much simpler. So you can see these applications have been running for a while. Um, I'm going to first walk through where that helper container is running as a sidecar, the authenticator client that initiates that authentication workflow, that, that spiffy based authentication workflow uh, where, it, where it's running as a sidecar. I can exec into the application container using this, this handy little script. Now I'm in the application container and I can run this script which simulates what an application would do using a REST API. So here's, here's the REST call, uh, basically this, this call here, get secrets. Um, this, this notation doesn't include the URL, but you can see that here's our, our URL uh, and the, the endpoint for getting a, a password. Basically, we're, we're doing that here. We're using some environment variables so the, the authenticator will drop that JWT token in a shared memory volume. So this application container has access to that JWT token uh, at this location. If we want to look at it, it's actually in run conjure access token. And so there's, there is my JWT token. Um, this is running as a sidecar. This token will be refreshed every six minutes. So the, the authenticator stays running and it's continually refreshing this JWT token every six minutes. So it never goes stale. I always have the ability to run my application to retrieve secrets. So when I run this application, it picks up the JWT token. It uh, base64 encodes it, trims the control characters out, out of it. Earl encodes the name of the variable because the, uh, the variable name has slashes in it. So basically converting these, these slashes to percent two Fs. And then we, we make our call to retrieve the secret, get the value, echo the value. So that all, that all happened there. I can go back in, edit, edit my application. I'm making air quotes when I say application because it, it really is just a bash script. But I can say uh, username here and retrieve the username just as easily. Oops. WQ in the web app. So now I've got the username. So we'll see this in the next uh, couple of examples. Oracle DB user is the username. Here's a good strong password with upper lower case numerals and special characters. So, so and, and this would be the thing that we would want to rotate, but now we're dynamically retrieving it. It's not part of the application. It's being dynamically retrieved from the service. The identity of this pod is being very strongly authenticated using that, that spiffy based authentication uh, protocol that, that we walked through. Um, we have the access token here and the application can pick up that access token and use the, the REST API or use any of the client libraries that we have because there, there are other ways 
Um, and so basically we have Java, Go, Ruby, and .NET uh, effectively wrappers for the REST API. Under the covers, everything's a REST call. Um, but these are little higher level uh, bindings for, for what, you know, these languages that you may be using uh, provide a little bit higher level interface. Um, but that means that your applications can always pull secrets. And so given that the sidecar is running there, that, that token is always going to be there uh, and, and fresh and, and be able to be used to retrieve secrets. So that's, that's our first example here where we've got an, exam, uh, an application using the API to retrieve secrets. And it would simply use that Oracle database username and password to connect to the database. Um, second example now is using uh, another open source project that CyberArk sponsors called Summon. Summon is a, a hugely useful tool. Uh, it is uh, something that, um, that solves just a ton of problems. It is that level of indirection that solves so many problems in computer science. So Summon will retrieve secrets and then call an application with those secrets populated in environment variables or in memory map files. The goal is to keep the secrets ephemeral, but not require the application to know how to authenticate or how to, how to retrieve secrets. In other words, the application is, is kept uh, blissfully unaware of where these secrets are coming from. And so that means that you may be pulling secrets from different places in different environments. Uh, so the application can stay immutable. The application's configuration doesn't have to know anything about where it's running. The secrets are simply injected into its environment uh, by, by Summon. So Summon will call a provider, uh, and it's a plug-in architecture. So providers uh, we have for key rings, for S3 buckets, for, uh, for lots of, of different things, uh, different backend systems. So this creates that level of abstraction where you can pull secrets from different backend systems provided for an application. The application doesn't have to know how to retrieve it, doesn't know where it's coming from. That way, the application in dev, maybe you're pulling secrets from keyring. Application in test, maybe you're pulling it from uh, you know, a, a, a key, Azure key vault. And in production, you could be pulling secrets from a production vault. So um, just, just hugely valuable. Um, so we're gonna use Summon in an application uh, in a Kubernetes application where the authenticator is running as an init container now. So uh, Summon starts up the application and typically Summon would be your entry point for the pod where Summon would, would pull the secrets, call the application, uh, then the application's off and running with its secrets. So there's never a, a, an, an opportunity for the application to retrieve secrets once it's started. Um, so this lends itself to that init container pattern uh, and if we go over here to my environment and look here, we've got the init container here. Now look, it's been running 79 minutes. Um, and so given that the init container uh, is running the authenticator, um, we may have an issue with our, our JWT token because we, we've already established that only lives for eight minutes. So if I go into this, this environment here, uh, then we can see that I've got a, a JWT token over here. Um, but that job token is suspect. And so when I run Summon, so just to, to give you a little bit more example of how Summon works, Summon will look by default in a local, uh, for a local file called secrets.yaml. And this describes the names of the secrets to retrieve. It doesn't say what provider to use. It doesn't say what backend system these are coming from. Uh, the contract of a uh, Summon provider is it takes a name in and returns the value of that. So it's, it's taking the name of a secret returning of the value of the secret. In this case, I'm using the, the conjure summon provider, which is going to use that access token to retrieve secrets with this name and place it uh, in an in a environment variable with this name for the username and this for the password. We can see this work if I say summon env uh, and then grep for db underbar, but it's not returning anything. If I say summon E and V without grepping, we can see why. I've got an invalid access token. So what I need to do is just go bounce that. So this is, this is the upside and the downside of using an init container in this scenario. Um, we, have, uh, we have the potential, if the application should ever want to go re-retrieve secrets, first off, we've kind of built in the fact that it doesn't know how to retrieve secrets. But if the application is going to get uh, ever get secrets again, it has to be restarted. 
Um, and so this, uh, we can see now we've got a new init container running here. I'm going to exec into that. And now if I say summon env and grep for things beginning with dd underbar, we've got a little bit happier path. We see that same Oracle database user and that same strong password here. And now I can use that to call a very simple application, which could then connect to a database. Uh, whoops, that's not the one I wanted. I want web app summon. So here now, what could be simpler here? I'm simply echoing these environment variables. Uh, if I run this by itself, it doesn't have anything to show because there is nothing in the environment that, that has uh, DD underbar in it, unless I run summon first. So I can say summon dash web app summon. And now we've got the, the app application has access to those credentials. But as soon as the application exits, those credentials disappear. They are completely ephemeral. And the cool thing is summon can pull secrets into memory map files. So if you have SSH keys or certificates or even configuration files, you can store those, retrieve those as dynamic, uh, in other words, non-persistent files. Um, and what summon will do is, is put the, uh, the secret, the, the, the environment variable has the path to the memory map file. Uh, so you still pertain file system semantics um, and that, that's a very cool thing. So uh, Summon is actually our most active, I was uh, told by uh, Jerry who runs our, our integrations and, and open source team, um, that Summon is our most active uh, open source project. And so, uh, and, and it's for good reason, it's, it's just enormously useful. It's especially useful for doing integrations for tools that can consume environment variables uh, and for which it would be very hard to add rest calls into it to, to pull secrets for itself. Uh, so we use this a lot where we don't have native integrations with the myriad CI CD tools that are out there. Uh, many of them can read environment variables or files and we can use summon to populate those and still keep secrets ephemeral. So uh, big, big advertisement there for, uh, for summon, but of course, Summon has to be baked into the application image. And I was uh, doing a, a POC a while ago, and someone said, well, why, why don't you just push them to Kubernetes secrets? You know, our, our, we've got all these applications that are already using Kubernetes secrets. Um, why don't you give us the option of using Kubernetes secrets, but just you know, address some of the concerns that you know, some of the issues around Kubernetes secrets. So this is, um, again, where the authenticator is going to run as an init container. But what we're gonna do is dynamically populate a Kubernetes secret. And this is kind of the, the best of, of both worlds and uh, has, has proven to be pretty popular. Um, it addresses some of the acknowledged risks that Kubernetes secrets have. And I don't think you know, anybody's unaware. Hopefully this is, this is all uh, uh, you know, firsthand knowledge to you, you all every, on the phone, but um, there, there are issues here, you know, so, and, and security issues. So, First off, they are encrypted at rest in an SCD only if you set it up that way. So you have to enable encryption in, in the SCD store for the uh, Kubernetes secrets to be uh, uh, encrypted. Second, this and this is this is the thing that that is is probably the most egregious. Um, version managing is mandatory. You always want to version manage your, your your stuff, right? So that's that's version manage everything is kind of DevOps 101. But now you've got a manifest that only base64 encodes this username and password. And you check that into GitHub. So now somebody has very easy access to those credentials. Anybody that can read your GitHub repo can now go through and easily base64 decode your, your Oracle database username and password. Um, this is the problem that we're most uh, able to address. Um, applications protecting the value of the secrets. Now this is a little bit of foreshadowing for the secretless solution that we're gonna show in our fourth example. Because once applications get the secret, you don't know what they're gonna do with it. They could leak it in a log, um, they, can, they can exfiltrate it for you know, nefarious purposes, um, and any user that can access a secret. So um, you know, applications, we can, we can address this. Users and anyone with root permissions, this is something that um, just your, your, your own native security discipline has to address. Uh, uh, keeping people from being root, you know, anybody that has root, you know, we, we're fond of saying, once they're root, it's game over. There's really nothing you can do once somebody's root um, because they can do memory scans, they can access keychains. Um, there's, there's nothing someone can do once they're root. This is, this is 
you know, a big part of our core business is just keeping people from being root on any, any system they're not supposed to be root on. Um, and if they are root, we know who they are and we know what they're doing. So, um, but you know, the user creating a pod also has the ability to look at that secret. So, so foreshadowing a little bit, um, we'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about secretless. But I wanna show how we address this concern because I think this is the, the most common experience most developers have is they do the right thing. And I'm gonna bet, I'd bet $100, there's at least one person listening to this webinar that has experienced this, where they did the right thing, they put their credentials in a file, they version managed their file, suddenly somebody has ac had access to those secrets. Um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 just a, 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 it's just the way things happen these days. Um, fortunately, GitHub has started adding hooks where they will alert you to the fact that you may have just checked in some credentials. But, uh, but Kubernetes, as far as I know, Kubernetes secrets manifests are not one because they're base64 encoded. They're not obviously uh, credentials. And so um, this is something that we want to fix. What we want to do is get those base64 encoded values out of the, the secret. We want to dynamically bind the Kubernetes secrets. So we want to keep the Kubernetes secrets. We want the application to use Kubernetes secrets natively, but we don't want the application uh, we don't want that that manifest to be uh, to be um, checked in with those credentials intact. So the way we do this is uh, I'll have to go find my uh, manifest DB credentials. Is um, by giving you an ability to uh, you know, find. My secrets manifest. Okay, here we go. My Kate's secret template here. So this is the uh, the manifest that we're using, uh, and this is what would get checked into GitHub. Uh, we can see now we've got our Oracle database username and password, the name of the secret here, and we've got this annotation here. Basically, this is a YAML array of and it looks kind of like that secrets.yaml file that, that Summon used, so the, the, the idea is very similar. When the uh, secrets provider container, so this, the secrets provider container is an init container that will do the authentication, do that, that initial authentication in order to retrieve secrets, but it will have a directive to this credential, to this secrets, uh, this Kubernetes secret, uh, and it will look for this annotation, iterate over this, and retrieve the value of this secret and patch the, the, uh, the Kubernetes secret with a, a base64 encoded value of that username and that password. So if I go up to, to my environment here, and, and, and now you know, this, this is a great use case for the init container pattern because it's going to instantiate that Kubernetes secret and then exit. The application has access to the Kubernetes secrets just like native Kubernetes secrets, but they're dynamically instantiated when that pod exits uh, or when, when you delete that deployment, then those secrets are, are dim. So, so the point is, we're never checking in base64 encoded secrets. This value here, the name of the database, uh, is not a secret, presumably. If it were, we could also store it as a secret. But, but in this case, we're just saying that's not a secret. It's really those, those access credentials. So I'm going to exec into my injector. I think that's the way I did it. Yeah. And so, um, and, and I can walk through the manifest if anybody wants to see how this is done. But basically, um, I have mounted these, uh, the, the, the Kubernetes secrets as both, actually, let me do this. Let me do a kubectl edit uh, secret DB credentials. This, this will, actually, in test apps. This will just kind of show you the effect. So, so remember our manifest, the username and password, the, the, here, here is our, our, our map down here uh, as an annotation. Um, but now we've got the username and password here as base64 encoded values. If I take that and echo it and pipe it to base64 decode, then, and, and let me just add a uh, echo here to get a line feed in there, I've got my username back. So, so that was my base64 encoded username, but it was dynamically patched. That, that secret didn't exist 
um, it, it existed only as uh, initially as the value without the base64 encoded values. The secrets provider iterated over that conjure map and instantiated those. So when I go into my environment now, they can be mounted as either environment variables or as, as volumes. Um, so if I do an env grep for uh, username, uh, actually I, I, I mount them as, as for consistency, I think, grep for db. So there's my Oracle db username and password mounted as environment variables with those same environment variables that we've been using in the other examples. But they're also mounted as, as volumes. And we would always recommend mounting them as volumes. Environment variables are much easier to discover from outside. So uh, it's, it's uh, something that we would always recommend um, that you, you mount them as files and access them as files. And that's basically what uh, this, this example does for, uh, uh, let's see, where did I do that? Uh, I guess I don't have a great example here. Um, oh yeah, so my web app summon now. So, so the this, this simple application that simply uses those environment variables can simply run, but now we're using secrets. We don't have to use summon to retrieve it. We don't have to bake summon into the application image. Uh, we can simply use that. Um, in, an, in another demo, I've got a, a one that actually reads the file and, and uses the file uh, versions, but in this case, these environment variables are populated by mounting them from that Kubernetes secret. So this really gets at this uh, this aspect of it. We're dynamically binding values retrieved from from Conjure into those Kubernetes secrets, patching those Kubernetes secrets. From the application's perspective, it's just a Kubernetes secret. It can be used uh, as a Kubernetes secret, and then when that pod exits and and you delete that Kubernetes secret, then it's gone. The real point is nothing's being checked into, uh, into GitHub. There's no secrets being checked into GitHub in any form, whether plain text or in base64 encoding. Um, these other issues remain. So um, you know, this, is, this is just good discipline in setting up your, your cluster. Uh, this is just good security discipline. Um, but let's talk about these couple of things because we, we, we use this uh, example here. You, know, you can vault things in storage, you can vault things, you can encrypt things on the wire, but as soon as the application gets that plain text secret, you really don't know what it's going to do with it. Uh, and so we see this as a, as a, a, a general issue. Uh, our best, all our efforts may be for not if the application is irresponsible. Um, and so what we uh, have devised is a solution called secretless. Uh, it's basically using a proxy connection so that the application never gets the secret. The application wants a connection to the database or it wants a connection to a web service or it needs to run a script on a, on a remote server over SSH. Well, we want to give the application the ability to do that without giving it the keys necessary to do that. So we do that with a proxy where the proxy is running as a sidecar uh, and the proxy is the thing that actually retrieves the secret and establishes the connection and brokers that connection for the application. So the application never gets a secret. The application you know, has to do its own authentication for users and, and, and things like that. But as far as connecting to backend systems, the applications simply get the connection that they're authorized to get. Uh, and so if, they're, if the identity that this pod is running as is, is authorized, you know, successfully authenticates and is authorized to connect to a database, it will get the connection to the database, but the application never sees those database credentials. They stay within the broker and therefore uh, can't be leaked. Um, so, you know, you're still suspect, you're, you're, as we said, once you root, you can do anything. So keeping people off route, but barring that, um, then we've addressed a lot of these issues where the applications uh, don't have access to the secret and can't inadvertently leak it in a, uh, in, in a uh, potentially irresponsible manner. So I'm going to start up my, uh, I actually should have done this um, while I was talking. I'm going to start my whole environment here because um, it deploys multiple backend systems. So the cool thing about Secretless is it's multi-protocol. It supports HTTP, HTTPS, SSH, uh, and then multiple backend databases, a growing list of backend databases. So we uh, support Postgres, MySQL, and SQL Server now. Uh, I'm told Oracle is, is on its way. We get a lot of questions around that. Um, 
uh, Oracle and SQL Server, are, you know, the most deployed um, uh, databases. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, exec into this. So I, I've set up an environment here where this window is going to be my application. So I'm going to exec into my uh, secretless app. Uh, uh, but yeah. And so uh, we'll we'll do a few things here. And and in, in here I've got some uh, predefined uh, connection strings just so I can remember, because I can never remember all the syntax for all these things. So I've got connection strings for HTTP, SQL Server, SQL, Postgres, and SSH connections. Um, and so what I'm going to do is walk through some of these. So this, this, this window over here on the left is basically my pod. This is my application. What I'm going to do here is watch the secretless broker uh, log. So this is just the log for that container. We can see that it started up listeners on different ports. So the way that the broker knows what to connect to is it's listening. It has service connectors listening on different ports. 1443 for SQL Server, 3306 for MySQL, 5432 for Postgres, 8081 for HTTP, 2022, uh, 2222 for SSH. So we've got listeners, we've got, we've got uh, service connections configured uh, such that when we do this connection, we're going to watch the uh, Conjure audit log over here, we'll see the connector, we'll see the broker authenticate, uh, see it retrieve secrets. And then what I'm going to do up here, uh, this is one of the only ones that really echoes its, its, uh, its activity, my Nginx server. I'm going to just watch the log of my Nginx server. So the first one we'll do is this uh, HTTP connection. And I'm just going to say curl. I'm just going to paste this in because environment variables don't always work. It doesn't work for SQL Server for some reason. So I'm going to say, I'm going to connect to Nginx on 8081. Now, what's really listening there is my, uh, my broker. And so this is um, basically going through an HTTP proxy for localhost. Um, that proxy connection is, is going to this port where the, the broker is listening. So this happens very quickly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through it, and then, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to hit return. We'll see the, the broker wake up and authenticate. We'll see it hit conjure to retrieve the secrets for the HTTP connection. This is using basic auth. This is just using basic auth back over here. We'll see a, a 200 message come up here in the Nginx log, and then we'll see the client echo. It's just doing a basic uh, index git on that, uh, that top level uh, entry point in, uh, in Nginx. So, so the flow kind of goes like this. So it happens quickly, so we'll go doink. There, did it happen. Um, Oh wait, I didn't do my, my Nginx. Uh, for some reason, I am not, I'm not seeing Nginx over here. So we saw it successfully authenticate. We saw it uh, return the value over here. For some reason, I'm not tracing uh, Nginx, Nginx log here. We saw it authenticate over here. We saw it uh, retrieve uh, secrets that it needed to do its work. Um, and so, this is uh, the, uh, the workflow that we're, we're looking at um, to, to authenticate, dynamically retrieve secrets, and then use those secrets to connect to a backend system. Now, we, we have other things that we can connect to. So let's look at SSH. So what I've got here are the credentials, the SSH keys, to uh, one of my uh, EC2 instances in, in uh, in uh, Amazon, in, in AWS. But we can see um, my connection string is just gonna say foo at localhost. This is garbage, this is just there, but so that the SSH client works. So I'm, I'm directing it to port 2222, where the broker is listening. Uh, that broker, uh, is that, that is the service connector for, for SSH. So when I hit return here, it's saying, hey, you haven't connected to this before, are you sure you wanna connect? We saw it hit over here. Uh, now I'm in AWS, so I, I have, connected to AWS without having access to that SSH key. The broker had access to it because it retrieved it from Conjure. It retrieved that SSH key from Conjure and used it to connect to my backend system. Now I can do uh, stuff up here. I can say curl, uh, you know, check, check the status of, because this is uh, something I leave running for doing demos up in, in Amazon or in AWS. 
Um, and so there's, you know, I can check the status of my, my conjure when we're running it there. So that's SSH. Uh, we can do similar things for MySQL. So if I uh, look, at, look at my MySQL connection here, um, here's, uh, I've got a, a test app running over there. So I can say MySQL, use the my, native MySQL client, local host connection, um, but now it's connected to the MySQL database. And I can say show databases. Um, the databases don't do a really good job of showing you the work. Their logs aren't very interesting from a connection monitoring standpoint. So you have to kind of jump through hoops to make them do that. Um, for the last trick, we'll just show SQL Server because a lot of people are really interested in SQL Server. What this will do is just do a real quick uh, SQL addition. So SQL uh, CMD is the client for that. Paste that when I run that. Um, I've got my, my uh, SQL Server answer here. So um, the, if I you know, do my KGP, well, actually I have to, KGP isn't defined here. Um, if we look at all the uh, things that are running in here now, um, we can see that there's quite a few more, uh, more pods running in my space here. So I've got my Postgres database, I've got my pet store app, I've got my Nginx server, I've got the SQL, uh, my SQL server, my, my SQL server. Then of course, um, the SSH uh, is, is going through the, uh, the SSH protocol to, um, to AWS. So the point is though, in none of these cases did the application in this space get access to those secrets, is able to connect to all these backend systems without using those. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the way this works, this is very similar. In fact, secretless is, uh, and could be very, you know, very easily positioned as a, uh, a, a broker, an access control broker for the control plane if you start thinking in service mesh um, type, type uh, situations. So um, hopefully everybody's familiar with the terms control plane and data plane, but the control plane basically is where all the complex stuff happens. Applications, we want to stay in the data plane. In other words, we want them to be working at a business logic level. We don't want them directly involved with the mess of running uh, the services. And so secrets management kind of kind of has that aspect to it. We want to keep applications uh, as blissfully unaware as possible of the mechanics of authentication, of retrieving secrets, of, of the effects of secrets rotation. We want to actually keep them away from the secrets entirely. And Secretless gives us the architecture for doing that. Uh, and so it is, it is that proxy for the control plane that applications can avail themselves of. And it also gives us a point where we could put telemetry on that. We could start monitoring how applications are, are consuming secrets. And that then starts informing a lot of the workflows that security can do uh, in terms of reacting to anomalous situations and, and other you know, sort of forward looking type things. So um, this is you know, a, a, very much a work in progress, but secretless is a, uh, a big part of the open source initiative that CyberArk is sponsoring around Conjure. Uh, it's all here under secretless patterns, so going to fundamentals. You can see how it works. You can see the currently supported uh, service connectors, uh, most of which I exercised here. So we see our HTTPS, our database connectors, uh, our SSH connector, et cetera. It also has an SDK, which is very cool. If, you know, for some reason you have a backend system, we get questions about things like MongoDB and other things. Uh, you can build your own. And that's the beauty of open source is you, we've given you all the tools to, to build your own. You have to assume that a breach is going to happen. And so um, risk is often um, defined as probability times impact. And so you can, and, and you can focus on those two separately. So how do you reduce the probability that something's going to happen? Well, you limit access. That's good segregation of duties. But the impact is also part of that because um, the fewer secrets a, a, an application has access to, the, the smaller the blast radius, as we call it. So um, segregation of duty is, is something that you hear about a lot. Being able to very uh, precisely define um, the, the, the uh, credentials that something has access to. Now, in terms of identifying an offender, that's where your audit logs come in. But in many ways, audit logs are, are backward looking. In other words, they, they record what happened but they don't give you that proactive ability to do something about it. And that's what I think is exciting about Secretless uh, is that 
it does give you that monitoring point where you could, if you wanted to, and of course there'd be some overhead in this, but you could monitor the, uh, the actual real-time usage of secrets and see if, if things were happening in a, in a much more immediate fashion. Um, but your audit logs, and, 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 and you know, we, we keep audit logs, non-repudiation, you want, you want to be able to prove something did or did not happen. Uh, and you want to say, uh, if something happened, you know, what was the identity responsible for? Now that identity uh, you know, may move around. It, so an IP address may or may not be useful in that context, but fundamentally it comes down to what was the identity in question uh, when, when we're looking in that, doing that kind of sort of forensic analysis. The uh, Conjure solution is in the Google Marketplace, um, but you can always go to Conjure.org. I was, I was showing a lot of the content that's at Conjure.org. Um, there is uh, community-based support for the uh, Conjure open source solution, as well as for Summon uh, and, and, uh, and Secretless. Um, you can go to discuss.cyberox.commons.org and, and see some of the back and forth there. Uh, we do uh, regular workshops. We do regular DevOps workshops, just kind of walking through uh, how to secure Jenkins workflows and, and pipelines, as well as uh, Kubernetes examples. Um, the Secrets Oath Broker, we saw uh, a, a good bit of today, as well as Summon. So lots of places to go, lots of content at, at uh, Conjure.org for you to consume.